Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the new advances in regards to the idea of artificial life. Life created completely from scratch. Very often combining our understanding of genetics with essentially our understanding how various cells form and how they eventually end up as various types of primitive life. And in this case we're going to be focusing on what you see right here on this screen. The creation of artificial life that can now move around by essentially acquiring new genes. But in order to understand this achievement, and in order to understand what the scientists actually created here, we first have to take a few steps back from this discovery, and briefly discuss some of the other discoveries from a few other videos you can find in the description. Now this idea of artificial life, or trying to create some kind of an artificial cell, is something that actually started to kind of explode in the last 10 years or so. And the biggest project that kind of deals with this, that we discussed in one of the videos in the description, is a project known as JCVI. The project that for the past decade or so, focused on creating the first ever artificial cell capable of performing basic functions of life. And this project only started approximately 12 years ago. As a matter of fact, the first version of this particular cell was originally built in 2010, with the major goal of this synthetic biology being the capacity to predictably design and build various types of DNA that can then actually end up producing a cell. And though the initial steps here are to basically try to create an actual artificial cell that's able to function just like any other cell that we have around us, eventually they want to actually find a way to even create new biological functions as well. And in order to make this work, the scientists behind the original study did something relatively clever. First, they tried to find the bacterium with the smallest known genome. In this case, they decided to focus on Mycoplasma mycoides, the parasitic cell that contains one of the smallest genomes from the known bacteria. But once the genes from the cell were identified and mapped, the scientists then started to essentially knock out some of the other genes in order to find out which genes need to be left behind in order for this organism to actually function. Or in other words, they basically wanted to remove any other additional genes present inside the cell, leaving an absolute bare minimum that can then result in a similar cell with potentially similar functions. And eventually they've discovered just over 450 genes that were absolutely crucial for the cell to function. Everything else though was more or less redundant, which resulted in the production of the first ever synthetic organism. But more and more advances have been made in the last few years, and the scientists started to push the envelope. First, they actually tried to find a way to have this organism replicate, which is what I've discussed in that previous video you can find in the description, while also discovering additional genes for a lot of other functions as well. In other words, they've created a kind of a bacterial Frankenstein's monster. An entirely artificial organism created from individual genes collected from several different cells, capable of performing certain functions very similar to a typical cell, but not all functions. As a matter of fact, this is still a work in progress. And quite a lot of new advances have been made in just the last few years. As you can see, we're now on version 3.0, and this organism, sometimes also referred to as Cynthia, to some extent has been evolving really quickly. Although in this case this is entirely artificial evolution. But in the last three years, a lot of this has been actually advancing pretty quickly because of computational modeling and all of the publications that made the entire genetic catalog from this particular cell available to essentially anyone. Identifying all of the essential, non-essential and quasi-essential genes, as well as giving comparisons to other organisms such as, for example, the famous E. coli. And so because of these advances in modeling and advances in genetics, it's now become a lot easier to modify the cell even further. And though last year we've discussed the advances in reproduction, this new advance coming from Japan involves motility, or basically moving around. And the thing about motility or moving around is that it's actually a really complex process, and it looks like a lot of different organisms evolved entirely different ways to move around using entirely different sets of genes. And moreover, a lot of these motility tools, for example cilia that a lot of bacteria possess for motion, were eventually evolved into entirely different, very important functions in much more complex animals like us. For example, this is an image from our lungs. And in this case, these same type of structures are essentially responsible for protecting our lungs and for maintaining our airways in order to allow us to breathe much easier. And so obviously understanding how this was created and how it evolved in various animals is also important for a lot of other medical reasons. But in this particular study, in this particular case, it represents the first step in understanding how motility might have evolved in simple life and what genes are responsible for creating simple locomotion. 
But interestingly enough, even though so many different cells learn to move around using various methods, even today it's still not entirely understood how some of these functions form and what genes are responsible for the formation of certain structures. But in this case, the synthetic cell, Cynthia, was essentially a perfect way to study this. By default, Cynthia does not move. It's a non-motile cell and it doesn't have any genes or ability to move around. On the other hand, one of the simplest bacteria that can move around is known as spiroplasma. It's believed that the motion here is achieved by basically shifting around the structure of the cell itself. Or in other words, by switching around the shape of the helix and by twisting and turning the outer cell wall, this bacterium can then perform a basic function of moving forward or moving backward. And so the idea here was to take some of the genes possibly responsible for this function and to then insert them into the artificial cell Cynthia, just to see what happens. With the obvious goal being a potential swimming organism that can basically switch around its cytoskeleton in order to propel forward or backward. Now prior to this, this has never been done before, and the previous motility was extremely basic and basically was not organized at all, and so this was definitely the first attempt to create a moving bacterium. But it didn't work right away. As you can see, even though spiroplasma moves around just fine, and Cynthia doesn't move around at all, the first versions of modified Cynthia were not moving either. But eventually they've discovered that you really only needed to have two genes, or basically only two proteins that would be required for motility of the cell. And so basically by removing all of the potentially redundant genes, they were able to create the first ever minimal motile cell, or essentially artificial cell that moves around by itself, with the name of the protein responsible being MREB. But intriguingly enough, this protein does exist in a lot of other bacteria or other cells, but in many other cells it doesn't seem to create anything, or at least does not create motility at all. And so this of course implies something really important. There are definitely multiple different evolutionary pathways that can create a similar function, with the same gene not necessarily creating the same functions. In this case it definitely created the necessary motion, but if you were to place the same gene in a more complex cell, it's unlikely to have the same effects. Which is why the team behind the study is already trying to find other genes that can actually create similar effects. And to be honest, these discoveries are actually important for so many different reasons. Not only the reasons of understanding how evolution works, but just the overall idea of creating artificial life with functions that you wanted to have. Or basically think of it as a kind of a sandbox Lego, where you have all of these Lego pieces which are your genes, that you can insert into an artificial cell in order to then create some kind of an artificial bacterium that does exactly what you want it to do. So basically kind of a genetic Lego. But obviously these are all still really really early steps, which of course means that we'll be hearing more about Cynthia and a lot of the discoveries of artificial cells for many years to come. This is honestly one of the most fascinating biological studies, studies that could one day lead to some major breakthroughs in genetics and of course in evolutionary biology. But for now, that's all we have. Now these cells can also move and, as you learned from the previous video, they can also reproduce. Although there was another study from a few years ago that also taught some of these cells to grab things as well. Something that's kind of interesting and intriguing if you want to create a cell that's able to basically pick up objects and drop them in a different location. But anyway, so for now at least that's all we have. You can check out some of the previous videos on this topic in the description below, but I'm definitely going to be coming back to this topic in the next few months just to see what the science has discovered and to see where all of this goes. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.